What's good? It's Wug. This Saturday, April 10th, we've got Jerron Boots Ennis, 26-0, versus Sergey Lipinitz, 16-1 and 1 draw. And Jerron Boots Ennis, by the way, uh, also has won no contest. In his last fight, it was stopped in the first round due to an accidental head clash. And it was his opponent, Chris Van Heerden, who suffered the actual cut, not Jerron Boots Ennis, which is good news if you're Boots. Now, Boots Ennis versus Sergey Lipinitz, you know, I even have a, a little issue with the way that that is framed. Boots Ennis versus Sergey Lipinitz, kind of painting Lipinitz as the clear B-side where, you know, Ring Magazine, for instance, has Lipinitz ranked number nine in the welterweight 147-pound division. I get it that Boots Ennis is the hot young prospect. He's only 23 years old and he's looking very uh, dynamic. So networks and promoters will usually want to spotlight that guy. But let's not act like Sergey Lipinitz didn't fight a competitive 12 rounds versus Mikey Garcia. Let's not act like Sergey Lipinitz didn't retire Lamont Peterson. I mean, Peterson was on his way out anyway, but it took Lipinitz to stop him the way that he did in the 10th round for Peterson to call it quits. Sergey Lipinitz is a serious business, and I think that a lot of people might be surprised, you know, just based on the way that this fight is being framed at how live an underdog Lipinitz might be right here. But they seem to want to pitch this as a Jerron Boots Ennis showcase. Now, Ennis has, has been looking spectacular since he turned pro just uh, like five years ago. Again, he's only 23 years old. He's five foot ten, so he's about the same height as uh, as Errol Spence. He's in the ballpark, Errol Spence height, which um, is kind of tall for the division. Now he actually has a seventy four inch reach. He being Boots Ennis, Spence at least on paper has a seventy two inch reach. So given the same you know height dimension, Ennis actually has a slightly longer reach than Errol Spence. Um, Terrence Crawford actually has a 74 inch reach so go figure Crawford actually has a slight reach advantage over Errol Spence at least on paper so Boots Ennis pretty tall 5'10 for the division 74 inch reach uh, again Floyd Mayweather has like a 72 inch reach so this is significant length we're talking and his fight style isn't he's not super happy feet he's not moving around the ring a ton He's a Philadelphia fighter, and he actually uses some of that Philly shell technique. He's orthodox, right-handed, but usually in early rounds, he's just overwhelming his totally outclassed opponents with, you know, flashy, like, uppercut, hook. And he likes to throw the hook, and then, uh, I'm sorry, he likes to throw the jab, followed by a hook where it's left, left. He also likes to do the jab and then dig to the body, or hook and dig to the body. He likes doubling up on the lead hand a lot and it looks spectacular he'll sneak in right uppercuts the guy's got a, a great offensive arsenal we just haven't seen him tested against anybody really serious yet and he's winning most of his fights via knockout out of his 26 wins 24 of them are by stoppage but again they're against totally outclassed opponents and even the ones who are able to last you know beyond the first couple rounds they kind of get him into a realm where he's no longer managing the distance in the middle rounds in the same way that he was managing it in the early rounds. So he moves around a little bit more in the early rounds, keeps people at the end of the jab, and then starts splashing them with power shots. In the case of one of his opponents from uh, Kazakhstan, I believe, uh, uh, Yuboff, this was like three fights ago. Now, Yuboff only makes it to the fourth round, but he's actually able to get... Ennis to just stand in one place, kind of shell up, not like this, but like this, and just kind of do the, almost the, uh, if you've seen Anthony Durrell, when he's kind of lulled into these brawl-like fights, it's not put your head down and start winging type of brawl, but it's a more sophisticated kind of, you know, you're, you're blocking a lot of the shots, but you're still kind of flat-footed. And the opponent might start getting busy trying to work your body and hit up top. And yes, you might be catching a lot of those punches or they might be glancing because of your defensive construct. You're also allowing the opponent to kind of paint the picture to the judges that they're the busier guy. 
So I do see Ennis's uh, volume decrease a little bit in the middle rounds. But I think that that's because he doesn't respect his opponent's power. He doesn't have much to worry about in there. And so he's basically just picking the guy apart. And again, even this guy who kind of made it that type of fight, Yuboff, he got finished in the fourth round. So that needs to be acknowledged. But Boots Ennis's opponent here, Sergey Lipinitz, he's not any of these guys. He is somebody who did get knocked down against Mikey Garcia at 140. And it should be noted, Lipinitz held a title at 140. He was the IBF champ, never defended it successfully. And in the different types of champions that I usually acknowledge, it matters a lot if you have a successful title defense. Because a lot of these guys will walk into a vacant title shot, meaning the champion dropped the belt to pursue other opportunities, and here you are competing for a title without really going through a rites of passage. And it's not like you're beating Shane Mosley for the title if you were like Vernon Forrest, who beat Mosley for the titles. So Sergey Lipinitz earned the IBF title in a vacant title shot against a Japanese fighter by the uh, le whose last name was Kondo like Akihiro Kondo, and he won that fight via unanimous decision, but then in his very next fight, he gets challenged, again, this is at 140, one weight class below this Jerron Boots Ennis, Sergey Lipinitz fight. Lipinitz is defending his 140 title for the first time versus Mikey Garcia, who was devastating at 126, devastating at 130, 135-ish, but he had this long multi-year layoff and ever since he came back he's still been a really good fighter at lightweight i think he could have been the best lightweight in the world and he was a title holder at 135 but he never fought lomachenko and that's a fight that i think was a huge huge missed opportunity it never happened but he earned a title at 135 then he goes up to 140 fights lipinitz for lipinitz's ibf title and mikey garcia did get bloodied up a bit Lipinets hit him with more shots, I'm sure, than Mikey Garcia thought he was going to encounter. So Lipinets made it a competitive fight, but still lost a unanimous decision versus Mikey Garcia, who again dropped Lipinets in that fight. So Mikey Garcia takes the IBF title, drops that to then go pursue Errol Spence even further up at 147, where he remains to this day. But I think he is totally missing the mark. I get that he's it's on a, he's on a paper chase trying to get that Manny Pacquiao fight like a lot of people do but at the same time he's kind of putting his career on pause in fact I had mentioned that Sergey Lipinitz was the number nine ranked welterweight according to Ring Magazine well Mikey Garcia was ranked 9-10 ish by Ring Magazine and that spot that 10 spot is now occupied by newcomer Virgil Ortiz Jr., who's also trained by Mikey Garcia's brother, Robert Garcia, the super trainer, great trainer, also Mikey Garcia's trainer. So Virgil Ortiz just took Mikey Garcia's spot at the bottom, or not the bottom, near the top, top 10, but the bottom of the top 10 in the welterweight division, largely because Virgil Ortiz is here getting after it, and Mikey Garcia did beat Jesse Vargas like a year and a half ago now, but it's been largely inactive and is really kind of blowing uh, so the, the last of his prime years. But back to Lipinitz, after losing to Mikey Garcia, he wins his next three fights, two by knockout, not against any world beaters, but he then fights during COVID, Custio Clayton, who actually fought him to a draw. A lot of people were surprised by that. This was more or less supposed to be, you know, a Sergey Lipinitz night because, again, he was a top 10 ranked welterweight who had been in that, you know, kind of high profile fight with Mikey Garcia. And he gets fought to a draw by a very little known Custio Clayton, who basically operated behind a jab, was able to control the distance, kind of keep uh, Lipinitz on the outside and was able to be effective when they exchanged as well. Lipinitz, I thought, rallied back. I thought maybe Lipinitz deserved the decision win, but I can see arguments from both sides. I actually should rewatch that one one more time just to get a, a closer beat on it. But, you know, with a lot of these fighters who were fighting during COVID, I give a lot of them a like a mulligan, like a pass, because training facilities weren't as available. Uh, travel restrictions were more restrictive. People were catching COVID. 
And so there are a lot of things that could throw somebody's regimen off in preparing for a fight. So I'd like to extend that same courtesy to Sergey Lipinitz. I'm not going to make too much of this Cussio Clayton fight. Now, Lipinitz is 32 years old, kind of a late comer. He's only been a professional for a couple more years than Jerron Ennis, but he's much more battle-tested. Again, he fought a over the hill, but he fought Lamont Peterson and to the surprise of many, stopped Peterson. Peterson's a durable guy. I, I, like Peterson was knocked out by prime Lucas Matisse at 140. He fought Danny Garcia to a super close decision loss. I thought Lamont Peterson should have gotten that decision win versus Danny Garcia. And then Peterson ran into prime Errol Spence Jr. and showed a lot of heart, but just got bludgeoned and eventually stopped. So... Sergey Lipinitz also has a stoppage over Lamont Peterson, which I think matters. Now, what also matters are those physical dimensions I was referencing earlier. Sergey Lipinitz is about 5'7 with a 67 inch reach. Boots Ennis, 5'10, 74 inch reach. Now, sometimes this doesn't matter. In this case, I kind of think it does. I think that. Sergey Lipinitz is going to be catching a lot of hellfire trying to close the distance on Boots, which I'm sure doesn't want to allow this to become a head-to-head, -head, shoulder to ch chest, chest-to-chest -chest type of phone booth fight. Even though, again, sometimes he invites it if he thinks he could just pick you apart with one, two, three shots at a time, still dictating the terms of the exchange. I think that Boots wants to keep Lipinitz at the end of the jab. Lipinitz is pretty good at dipping and closing the distance, but even against, you know, the elite fighter that he fought, Mikey Garcia, he was eating a lot of jabs trying to get in. Now, he did get in effectively enough to make it a competitive fight, but not well enough to win the rounds. And a lot of people might think that Boots Ennis is going to just smoke Sergey Lipinitz, but I actually think that because of what I saw with Lipinitz versus Mikey Garcia and in a couple other fights, Lipinitz is going to be competitive enough to keep the rounds close, but I think that Ennis is going to win the vast majority of them. I'm talking maybe 8-4, to 9-3, maybe even 10-2. to two. I'd be surprised if he wins every round or like 11-1. to one. I'd be kind of surprised by that. I expect Lipinitz to put some heat on Ennis. I expect Ennis to have certain rounds where he's taking more punches than he would like, but I still think that his sharp shooting, his reach... And he's a hard puncher, too. That should be noted. I think I noted that a couple times with his knockout percentage, even if it was against less than elite or even less than good competition. Lipinitz is a pretty tough dude to, to really break down. So I think that instead of breaking down and stopping, I think he's going to be winning rounds and not stopping, he being Jerron Ennis. But I am going with Jerron Ennis here with a competitive decision win. If he stops Sergey Lipinitz, then damn. And also, Sergey Lipinitz can pull off the upset here. We haven't seen Boots tested to a severe degree. But he is from Philadelphia. Philly's known to have some tough fighters throughout the years. Bernard Hopkins, Smoking Joe Frazier, and several others. So I don't expect him to just fold like a lawn chair when Lipinitz starts putting the heat on. But I do expect him to be technical enough and gifted enough to win, the, to win the rounds, to connect with the cleaner, harder shots over the course of more rounds. But yo, these odds are disrespectful. Like, Jerron Ennis opened up as like a 5-1 to one favorite, which in itself is like, whoa, whoa, you talking about that guy who we know can compete at a high level against elite fighters? Not necessarily beating the best, and to be clear, I don't think Mikey Garcia is one of the best at 147, but I think that he could be the best at 140 if he still has all of his attributes. I think that he could give Josh Taylor or Jose Ramirez, which they wouldn't fight. They've got the same trainer, Mikey Garcia's brother, Robert Garcia. But if Mikey Garcia were to fight Josh Taylor, if Garcia's heart is still in it and he's still Mikey Garcia, I would actually favor Mikey Garcia against Josh Taylor. And Josh Taylor is about to fight Jose Ramirez to unify all four titles. That's a big fight coming up. But these 5-1 to one odds for Jerome Boots Ennis against Sergey Lipinitz, I thought that was pretty disrespectful. 
But what's even more disrespectful is where the betting on where the betting odds and the line is closing. He's like a 17 to 1 favorite now. Like a minus 1700, Jerron Ennis. And I mean, by contrast, it doesn't mean that the bet swings the other way for the underdog. So it's not like Sergey Lipinis is a like a one a seventeen to one under uh, underdog. He's like a four and a half to one underdog. Which again, I think that that's still a little bit rich, you know. With a lot of these prospects, Daniel Dubois, for instance, who just fought and lost to Joe Joyce, still undefeated, Joe Joyce. People really need to have that rites of passage. You know, Teofimo Lopez, we didn't know it at the time, but Nakatani was serious business. It turns out he is, right? Richard Comey, as evidence in his last fight, looks like he might be serious business. And then Vasil Lomachenko. We know the young phenom Teofimo Lopez is the real deal, right? Less sure about Devin Haney and Ryan Garcia, though we've now seen them in step-up-ish competition. Ryan Garcia more so than Devin Haney. We're about to find out with Haney against Jorge Linares. Now, I'm not asking that prospects fight Vasil Lomachenko. That was an insane gamble. That paid off. But with a lot of the prospects, we've got to see them incrementally work up the ladder of quality of opponent. And this right here is Jerron Boots Ennis's first significant step up. So hold off on the 17 to 1 stuff. You know what I mean? But we'll see. Again, I'm going Jerron Boots Ennis to beat Sergey Lipinitz via decision. But yeah, let me know what you think about this fight. Please leave your comments in the comments, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. By the way, if Jerron Boots Ennis does win this and wins impressively, how do you see him stacking up against, you know, the field at 147? He is at the right spot. He's with PBC, who have Errol Spence, uh, Keith Thurman, Sean Porter, Ugas, who's, you know, the new WBA champ since the WBA just stripped Manny Pacquiao of his super champ status. He's now champion in recess. Not quite sure what that means yet. But Ugas with PBC, uh, Danny Garcia, even though Danny Garcia says that he's about to step up to 154, I think that's a bad idea. But Danny Garcia is on PBC. But yeah, let me know how you think this prospect, Jerome Boots Ennis, would stack up against some of the cream of the crop at 147. And you could even throw Virgil Ortiz in there, even though he's not with the same platform, so it's hard to imagine that getting done. You could also throw Manny Pacquiao and Terrence Crawford in there. How good do you think Boots Ennis could get? And where do you see him ranking uh, among these other prospects? And it's got to be pound for pound, right? Because the other major prospects that we think about in this new class are down at 135 and even 130. But yeah, let me know how good you think Jerome Boots Ennis is. Thanks again for tuning in.